simplicity's sake, it's much easier to teach you to mix a colour if we're starting off from exactly the same one. I mixed up heaps when I first started. I'm going to put white in it, and I'm going to put more cerulean in it. So it's going to give me a lighter and a bluer version of that colour. Rule of thumb with colour mixing is to put a little bit in at a time. Often I found that I mix it up and before I know where I am, I've, I've got a whole bucket full and really I only needed a thimble full. So if you just put a little wee bit in at a time, you just keep mixing it until it, all the streaks are out. It's not streaky, just like mixing the cake at home. I'm looking for two components in, in this colour. I'm trying to get the right value of colour and the right hue of colour. I can mix it up, compare it with my photograph, compare it with my oil sketch. Once I've got it, away I go. Now, through here, That colour can be darkened up to bring it forward. In the interests of oil, in aerial perspective, we must darken it up. That same colour as it appears a good three, four hundred yards closer to me has got to be darker. So I'm just adding more of the pigment, which is, in this case, cerulean blue. In it goes. Now, where I'm getting this colour going over the top of the other colour, I've got to be very, very careful. I put the original colour on thinly, as you may remember. The reason I did that is because I knew I'd be coming back over it later. You cannot put fat paint onto fat paint. So to that degree, you've got to plan it. If you know you're going to come back into it later, you have to put thin paint on. That's plenty of medium. Keep the paint thin. If you're putting another colour, especially a lighter colour, which is very easy to get dirty, on top you have to make sure that it's actually thicker. So this colour is slightly thicker and I can cut holes in it. Because it's thicker, it's going on. It dirties up my brush so I can wipe it on my bit of paper. Make sure that I preserve clean brush. I got the, don't get very many swipes with the brush and it's too dirty and I've got to actually give it another clean. As I'm going through here, what I'm interested in is just creating shapes. I don't want to be boring. The actual shape where that beach touches those rocks is most important. mustn't be boring. You can actually just soften the edge up just a little bit. Now then, just to make sure that you've got it nice and interesting and you haven't overdone it, you can actually place the odd other shape going into that by taking this colour here, putting it on fairly thick, just place the odd one here and there to just break up that pattern. Now don't get into the habit of putting the same tired old shape. If you find one shape that's nice, three of them are not three times nicer. You've got to make sure that you add variety to it. Now 
Now then, I've mixed up a dark colour. What I have done is I have taken this colour and I have added ultramarine blue and viridian to it. And I have actually arrived at a colour which is quite a lot darker. Mostly ultramarine blue. There's very little else that I added to it. And I've got a colour which is quite an attractive colour, which is just the rocks appearing down through here. Now as I get up through here, I've added alizarin crimson to it to warm it up, and it just gives a little bit of variety here and there. Now we're just going to be creating shapes with this. I'm loath to take a small brush because if I do, I invariably start puddling with it. If I keep with a, a big brush, it's very difficult to make that mistake. So I tend to persevere with a brush which feels too big for me. If it feels slightly too big, it's probably the right brush. I'm just putting in the absolute darks here, where the light's not getting at all. I'm making suggestions for what I'm doing. Try and remember that this type of painting is actually Impressionism. So what we're trying to do is just create suggestions. I suppose if you were to compare it with other art forms, such as, say, writing a book, you could say that if you were going to reproduce a photograph or a painting in its absolute detail, you would be comparing it to maybe writing a novel. Whereas with Impressionism, I'm only creating an impression. I'm trying to put down as little detail as I can that will trigger responses in your subconscious. Memories, things that you've got stored away, and your brain will actually let you see things that you haven't actually seen, but I've just suggested them. And that's called Impressionism. And that, in the simile again of writing the book, that is like writing a poem. What I'm trying to do is to write you the book with as few words as possible. So I bear that in mind when I'm doing my painting, that I keep it as brief as possible, and I just write you a poem. Now, we haven't put on any highlights at all as yet. So far, all we've done is half tones and shadows. And the fun will start when we start putting on the highlights. Don't fall into the trap of finishing an area of a painting. You must let the whole painting move towards completion together. It's got to go through an ugly stage. If you don't allow it to go through that ugly stage, the stage where you really do, do a lot of worrying about it, uh, then it's just not going to come right. So let's push on. These colours that I've put up through here, I really ought to look at reflecting them. So I'm going to mix them into my reflection colour. That's fairly simple. Just take a piece of my reflection colour and I'm going to mix those colours into it. I think that little brush is a little small for my purposes. There's lots of other details in that bank that are crying out 
for me to put, be put in, but I'm loath to because I want to keep it simple. I want now to just put in what is going to be the highlight in the distance there. Because there's so much atmosphere, the highlights were being affected by this misty atmosphere and the highlights really weren't very strong. So I'm going to take this colour and I'm just going to add white to it. And because the sun is warm, I'm just going to warm it up. I want to lift it in value slightly and I want to warm it. What is happening is that the sun is striking it, which is lightening it and warming it. So just take that colour and lighten it and warm it. There's that colour. I'm just taking it, I'm adding it in. Warm up with just a smidgen of the, maybe the cadmium red. We'll just see what it looks like. Yes, that's warming it up just a little bit at a time. Now the sun is just striking the tops of those trees there in the distance. Tend to, when they're that far back, I tend to put them on with a palette knife like this. That stops me from putting on individual trees and I just tend to put on the overall impression. Well, I, while I've got it, I must remember to reflect that colour. All right then, now that we've placed the highlights through here, we'll look at the highlights on this forward bluff. Remembering that this is much closer, there's less atmosphere between my eyes and what I'm seeing, so the highlight is going to be much more contrasty. It's going to be less affected by that atmospheric colour. Nevertheless, we'll start off with that atmospheric colour, which is a blue. We'll add yellow to it. And of course, blue and yellow gives you green. Uh, and yellow ochre, which very much helps to give that colour a believable look. Often what happens is that a, a colour can get so strong in pigment that it's just not believable. So an earth colour added to it can really help. Burnt sienna or yellow ochre, very good like that. Makes the colour quite believable by dirtying it up a little bit. I compare that with what I've got in my sketch and my photograph. Compare it with what I've got up there. I'd like to actually mix up several different variations of highlight because remembering it's in the front now and it's close to us so we can see a lot more detail. We're going to see a lot more than what we saw in the distant headland. So two or three different variations, different kinds of trees would be quite interesting. So I might take an, uh, another colour that is maybe a bit darker in value and use that as a base. Maybe one of the darker colours through here, which I've preserved. I always keep some aside. And I'll tint that in exactly the same way. With some yellow. Some yellow ochre. This time maybe a little bit of burnt sienna to it. Now we'll see what that looks like. The rule of thumb with oil colours is to always put your darks on first. Very seldom is that ever broken. And you work up from your darks to, your, to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, till you get higher and higher and higher in value, and you finish off with the highlights. I don't want to put too much of this green on because It'll destroy the atmospheric look through there. So I just want to give subtle tints. Trying to keep it as simple as we can.
Now, we're also getting a nice pink colour coming through. And it's striking the rocks. It's actually striking that bluff coming up through there. Lots and lots of areas, especially the bits of trees, it's striking bits of the bank, and that really does give a nice warm feeling. There's grass up through here. There's quite a lot of nice subtle detail which I want to put in, so I'm going to take white, and I'm going to add some cadmium to it. Now that's a good example of a, a colour which tends to take over. Some of those colours are very strong in pigment. I added ever such a little bit to that white and it's well and truly taken over. And I've got to add a lot more white to compensate. And if you're not careful, you wind up with a bucket full of paint and you only really need it a little wee bit. That's miles too light. I'm going to tone it down. I'll put a bit of burnt sienna into it to give it a little bit of a dirty colour. That's better. Now I'm going to use that colour as it is, but I'm also going to add some of it to my tree highlight colour, which is going to give me the impression that the sun is bouncing off those trees. Let's hope. Put it on nice and thick round there. I don't like to be repeating myself, but I have to stress because the number one mistake I think I see with uh, students that I teach is that they become repetitive. Don't be repetitive. Try and show as many different brush strokes as you can with the same brush. If you find something that looks attractive, three or four of them is not going to look three or four times more attractive. It'll actually detract. It was full of uh, cicadas and it was a beautiful day. I'd like to try and create the impression of that beautiful day if I can. Now, I hesitate to do any more to that just now because before I can have time to have a good look at it, if you just keep going without stopping, you run a very bad risk of overdoing it. You're too close to the action. If you don't sort of stop and say, hey, I don't quite like that yet, but um, I think I'll leave it for the meantime and give myself some time to get used to it. Go and do something else. You may find that in its context with something else that it's bang on just like it is. So um, don't play with it. I've got to reflect those colours. So that's a good excuse for me to leave it alone. I'll come down here and reflect those colours. Again, variety is the name of the game. Smoothing it off with gentle brush strokes like that. Make sure that you go right underneath the object you're reflecting. There are some laws of nature that don't ever bend. And if you want to remain credible, you've got to obey them. The trick is with Impressionism that you put in very little detail, but what detail you do put in must be right. Because whenever you do make a statement, 
that statement has got to be reliable. Thus the reason, of course, you'd never have horizons running uphill and things like that, because as soon as you did that, you'd lose credibility and the illusion would be broken. All right, now then. I want to take that dark colour which I used to just cut in these dark rocks here, and I want to just create this little area we're going to make the tide go out a little bit. Now, to reflect that, it's simply a matter of placing the brush on it and flicking it gently down. Just kissing the surface, it's only just touching the surface and just flick it down. I'm changing colours, especially when going from a dark colour to a light colour. I must clean that brush off. That blue through there. Just flick it down to form a reflection. Nothing difficult about that at all. Now that that highlight I mixed up, which was the nice bright colour, I haven't forgotten that. Notice again I'm using a brush much too big. I'd far rather use the brush miles too big and use on the edge and risk puddling with it. Very important that we just create that illusion. I've kept some of those colours that are over there in that, that bank, the half-lit rocks, and I'm just mixing little bits of that highlight to them to just pick out the odd one here and there. In the absolute dark blue colour again, I've still got with me to just continue the illusion of rocks by... What I'm doing is I'm painting in rocks, not by painting the rocks, but by painting in the gaps between the rocks. When I've got a little wee brush in my hand like that, I've got to be careful that I don't labour with it. I'm going to place in this area through here, it was quite a lot of sparkly water. I'm going up high in value in colours, so that's as good a time as any to have a good old clean up. I don't want to get those dark colours mixed in with them. While we're having a clean up, I'll just mention my brush cleaner here. Try and remember that Terps does not dissolve paint, it merely suspends it. And if you are going to just clean your brush in a normal tin, you'll clean your brush the first time, that'll be fine. But what happens is that the paint is settling in a sediment in the bottom of the tin. And the second time you clean your brush, you're only cleaning it in the sediment that you put there the first time. And you're working that paint up into the ferrule of your brush. Not only is that going to reduce the life of your brush, but you're not going to get a very clean brush. So what I do is I actually have a small tin I've taken that small tin and I have put a screwdriver against it and just hammered it so that I can create very small holes. Lots and lots of small holes in the bottom of that small tin. It then goes inside my main tin and 
The terps actually covers the small tin inside, so therefore I'm cleaning my brush on the clean small tin and the sediment is going down through the holes and is settling in the bottom of the main tin. So therefore I'm cleaning my brush in relatively clean terps. As the sediment goes to the bottom and gathers on the bottom, you can then remove your small tin and throw it away the big one and clean out your little tin and put it into another tin. And you've got a whole new brush cleaner again. All these little tips can really help. Quite often people say to me, golly, your colours are nice and clean. How do you keep them clean? Well, that's certainly at least 50% of my secret, which is now no longer a secret. Very good. Now then, we are going to just start off once again with our atmospheric colour in white. This colour, I'm adding white and more cerulean blue. So I'm getting a, a slightly bluer, lighter version of it. Plenty of medium. And on it goes. Now this colour here can go up into the sky because I'm actual fact there was there was uh, quite bright sunshine over there and we're going to have quite a bright sparkle on the water which I'll be putting on later with a pellet knife. So this goes on nice and thin so that I'm not going to be fighting with it later. I don't have to worry about covering the board because the board is, t is tinted. I don't have to worry about covering the white. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that colour up close. When I've got it well and truly on, I can brush it across till it's nice and smooth. Vertical brush strokes to just tidy it up. Now I've got it on, I can bring the two colours together. Clean that out with my brush, replace it with some of this colour and I can brush that down into it. Nothing of any earth-shattering uh, importance, nothing particularly difficult. Now as that is coming closer and closer to me, it's getting darker and darker, remembering that the water is reflecting the sky that's above it. As the sky gets further and further over our heads, it's getting darker and darker. So the water has to get darker and darker. So therefore we create the illusion of distance by suggesting that very thing. We just darken that up with more cerulean and viridian. Or hooker's green if you like. I seem to use hooker's green or in viridian about the same amount. It depends on which one I can buy at the time. And they're very similar, it seems. Now we've mixed up that colour. We can start placing it in. Again, I keep it thin. I scrub it. Very unceremoniously scrub it in there. Once I've got it on, note I'm leaving a gap between where those two colours are and where that colour is there because I don't really want to get it dirtied up. In actual fact, I'm a little bit concerned about this area through here. I'm not too happy with the reflection. See how that reflection shape there must 
be followed by this one here. So I'm going to have to modify that a little bit. Once I've got that colour in, I can blend the two together so that it goes gently from one colour to the other. Now I want to get darker still as I come further forward, so I'm going to add more of the cerulean and the hookers. Both those are very strong pigments, so we have to be very careful not to overdo them. Especially the, the hookers green, it's a very powerful green pigment. There's only one that I know of which is stronger, which is thalocyanine, if you can say that. But very, very strong indeed. If you're not careful, it'll take over. So now we've got it darker again, just for the very front. Once you've got it on, just blend it with vertical brush strokes to just blend the two colours together. Vertical and horizontal brush strokes. When it's, you do a bold stroke like that, it's just kissing the surface. Sometimes you have to do a couple of dummy runs till you get lower and lower and lower and till you eventually just strike the surface. Most important that it, you don't overdo it. Now you can create the illusion of waves. Just remember that a wave is actually just really a, a hill of water and all that water does doesn't seem to have a lot of colour of its own but it steals colour from other things. So it's reflecting what's directly above it. So as the water comes towards you, we've already covered the fact that it reflects the sky and it gets darker as it comes forward, but as it goes up like that, it's going to strike the light across its top edge. As it rolls over, it's going to start reflecting the light directly over your head. And it's going to go suddenly a very darker colour. So you can create the illusion of the water by placing dark and very light, or, or white light. And we'll do that by just adding a smidgen of ultramarine blue which is a nice dark blue and the viridian again to that last colour. I'm adding, I'm actually adding cerulean blue which is a nice sky blue and I'm bringing it down in value by adding a smidgen of the ultramarine blue.
remembering that this is not a surf beach, so we don't have, it's not appropriate to put in a lot of waves, but we're just going to make a suggestion that there are just the odd wave on the surface. Now then, our reflection colour, I've still got some, it's this colour here, I'm just going to flick that out, just to make some interesting shapes through there. We have the nice streak of light coming through there, which I would like to preserve. I remember that on the day, it was an area that really took my eye. We have that pink colour, which I put up through here. It can go on nice and thickly. Mustn't play with it. We also had that colour appearing all over the painting, actually. It was a painting which was glistening with the light. Now then. I think most of those colours are reflected. We need to just make sure that they're reflected. Now we've got this nice light sparkle on the water. So we're going to take white I think that white and a wee bit of the, the cadmium red. I'm, I'm loath to put white all on its own because it seldom appears in nature. Even the, the bright white from the sun is a warm white. So I'm taking the white and just warming it with some cadmium red. And that we can put on with a palette knife represents the glare on that water. Palette knife's ideal for this because it goes on more random. Uh, if you put it on with a brush, you tend to have your pet brush stroke and you repeat it over and over and over again. And you wind up with trees that are like shark's teeth um, or very repetitive rock shapes or whatever. But wherever the temptation is to make something repetitive, then palette knife's good can give you a nice clean colour too. I think that we'll have a nice sunny sky. And I think I'd like to have some of that nice orangey colour coming through up there. I think I'll hide the horizon. I like an area of mystery in a painting, actually. Now, if we're going to have it nice and light up through there, as I've just placed, we have to make sure that we do the same thing underneath in the reflection down through here. One of the pleasures of, of oil painting, unlike watercolour, you can change your mind. With watercolour, 
you've got to plan it right from the very beginning. And if you change your mind halfway through or something goes wrong, well, generally speaking, you can throw it away. But with oils, it's so forgiving. You can shovel it around, you can make mistakes, change your mind, Brilliant, especially for a duffer like me, because I change my mind often. So I'm just trying to get a soft look through there without overdoing it. I guess it's harder for me because I'm sort of seeing it how it should be rather than how it is, whereas you don't really can't see inside my head as to what I'm trying to do, so it's probably appears like I'm playing with it for nothing. However, I can now start placing that sky as I'm going because I'm placing in really I've made the statement of what's going to be up there by what I've put in here. If I wanted to put a nice big cloud bank up there then of course I would have to reflect it in there. It's only logical. Now this sky, you remember what I was talking about before when I talked about cutting holes? Well, this is where Many of you will probably get the shock of your life because it's precisely what I want to do through here. I'm more interested in the shape left in the sky by that row of trees. Now there's a whole subject which we could get involved in here and we haven't got the time. There's been books written about it and maybe one day I'll make a video about it. But it basically says that you've got to be thinking on the right side of your brain in order to be able to see this way. That's why artists are an un unusual breed. But as long as you are thinking logically, you'll always think that trees grow up this way with brown trunks and they all have green foliage going this way. And as long as you're thinking like that, you're going to put in a symbol for a tree which looks cross between a shark's tooth and an umbrella. What I'm interested in is shapes and patterns. In this case, I'm interested in the shape left in the sky by that row of trees. And that is much more interesting. I'm using a brush that smiles too big. It stops me from becoming too fiddly. I can let that start to get blue now. As it starts to move away from the light, it can start to get some blue in it, so I'll get some cerulean blue. We're going to place that colour in through there. As we are moving away from the light, we are getting cooler and cooler, and darker and darker. Now I'm going right up to that colour, Occasionally I get a little bit on the brush, but only a little bit, so it doesn't matter. And now I can cut the odd little hole in there. Now that needs to have that ear, that line through there just made fuzzy. I'm just going very dust, lightly dusting over that to just fuzz it up so that it recedes back into the headland, back into the distance headland there. And as we come further to the left, it's got to get darker and darker, so I'm adding more and more cerulean, which is just bluing it up and darkening it up 
as it goes further to the left. And we finish off the left hand side there with a nice darkish blue. Again, I need to just fuzz that detail up there. I want it to be not a crisp edge. I just want to make a warm white. I didn't want it to be a, a, exactly a white. As that comes down, it's just striking the tops of the odd wave. There was a area through there which was just, it, I don't quite know what it was, whether or not it was an area that was breaking the surface or what it was, but it was quite interesting and I can remember it. We have the light just catching the tops of the of waves. There was lots and lots of little like bubbles going out across the surface here. But the things I've taught you aren't necessarily rules that you must stick to. They're what work for me. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're golden rules and everybody that's successful must do that. A lot of artists who are a lot better than me don't necessarily follow those rules. But I can guarantee you that if you want to paint on location, you've got to be organised and there's a special thrill if you can pull it off. There's so many things working against you, but if you can do it, there is a tremendous thrill. And if you've never tried it, if you've never tried painting, why don't you give it a go? Because you never know, there might be a talent there that you didn't even know you had. And if you didn't give it a try, you'll never know. Best of luck.